E A R. I think my life has been dictated by that word for the past 34 years or so. And today I want to share with you guys a story. This is a story time, all right? I want to share a story with you guys about why I've lived in fear for 34 years. So let's go back. Picture this. 1984, December the 10th. So the, a decision was made that I needed to have surgery. I was only 18 years old. I had just turned 18 August the 14th of that year. And I had just graduated high school on June the 14th of that year. And believe it or not, I met Joe July the 14th of that year. So a lot was happening. So um, I have been having trouble with my menstrual cycle since I was about 13 or 14. And then I came to America when I was 15 and I started to see the doctor. And then when I turned 18, they decided that they were going to do a DNC because they wanted to fix this problem. Sometimes that's the only thing that can fix the problem. So during the DNC, they were going to do something. I can't remember the name of the word, but I think it's like hysteroscopy or something like that. They were going to put a camera. They're going to do something and put a camera inside of me because they wanted to check for polyps and stuff. So this surgery was not even the dangerous part of everything um, that was going to happen to me, actually. It was something else. It was the anesthesia. And I want you guys to keep in mind that I just learned a lot of new things over the past few days since I've had my gallbladder surgery. And so I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to tell the story. I think I'm going to tell it from the, the wisdom and the knowledge that I had from back then. And then I'm going to reveal what I've learned recently because now that I know a whole lot of things, I don't want to act like I knew everything that was going on back then. All right. So I have a little book here. I wouldn't say that it was a, a, a diary, but I wrote about my surgery in it back then because I wanted to remember everything. So it's a lot that I wrote, but I highlighted the things that I want to share with you guys today. So um, they decided to do the surgery. I got to the hospital. It was the surgery was done on a Monday, December the 10th. I got to the hospital like four in the morning. My dad dropped off my mom and my aunt Radiance. Now aunt Radiance is not a blood relative, but she was such a dear friend of my mom when we first came to California that she has the honor of being my aunt. Okay. <laughs> so anyways, um, they dropped us off. They, you know, admitted us and started to work me through the lineup for the surgery. And I was supposed to go under like, I want to say 10 o'clock in the morning, but they, they took me away from my, um, my aunt radiance and my mom, like around 10, but they didn't operate on me until around noon. So that was already two hours that mom and, and auntie radiance was waiting on, were, were waiting on me and not knowing what's happening, like what's taking the surgery so long. Right? So this was at the county hospital in LA women's county hospital. So, um, as they were putting me under, I asked, um, the anesthesiologist, I said, um, are you going to give me an injection? And he said, no, I'll put it in your IV. Cause they had put an IV like right above my ring finger here. And that medicine always burns that they put in the IV. And then he asked if I was feeling a little bit sleepy. And, um, I said that I was feeling a lot sleepy. So then he said, count back from a hundred skipping two. So I remember saying a hundred. I remember saying 98. And saying 97, I didn't even skip two because I was gone. What felt like one minute later, this is what happened. I said, I wrote in my book, when I, when my mind woke up, I heard Dr. Mandel, that's the doctor that did the surgery say, she's paralyzed. I thought, oh my God, I'm going to be paralyzed for the rest of my life. And then, and then Dr. Farah, this is another doctor in the room said, she has to come around. A nurse with a Spanish accent shouted, Barbara, wake up, honey, wake up. That's how I, I remember her accent so vividly, guys. Dr. Noshiguchi, no, this doctor was mean to me as I was preparing for the surgery. He was matter of fact, and he just seemed like he didn't have any kind of caring as I was doing my pre-op and stuff like that. But in the surgery, he was different. You know, well, after the surgery, I should say, was sticking me with a needle to draw blood, but my veins collapsed, so he couldn't. Someone loosened a valve on my respirator. I think they like, they, they, they moved the hose or something, which was pushed way down my throat and I couldn't breathe. Dr. Mandel shouted, she's gasping. When I couldn't get any air, I thought perhaps that, 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 that I had asthma. I've never had asthma before, but in my stupidity at that point, I thought I had asthma. So this Jamaican nurse that was in the recovery room, I met her before I went under. 
and she knew that I was from Belize, so she said it like this in, in Creole. Poor little girl. I told her she would be fine, but no, look what happened. By this time, my heart was beating fast, and I could hear the machine going beep, 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 and I could hear my, 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 I could feel my, my heart beating even faster. A woman doctor hooked up some wires to my temples and turned on the machine. I felt as if someone shot me with a pellet gun. Now, I've never been shot with a pellet gun, but I just figured that's how it felt. And tears came down my cheek and they would wipe it off. And Dr. No Dr. Nushiguchi was the one that wiped it off. A doctor ordered a nurse to put a catheter in me and I felt all of that. That was not nice, okay? So anyways, let me set this aside to continue telling you the story as I remember it. So this went on for about eight to ten hours because i had the surgery at noon and i don't think i really became unparalyzed until like eight o'clock at night and then they didn't take me off the respirator till like 10 at night so it, it was a while it was a while it was a very scary situation for me just keep in mind that this was my first surgery i was 18 i didn't know anything about all these doctor terminology and stuff like that so when i woke up completely uh, and I was trying to talk with them. The tube was down my throat and I kept saying, you know, pointing like this, like, please take it off. And they're like, we're going to take it off if you can raise your head two inches off of the pillow for 10 seconds. So I did all of that, right? And I'm counting one, one thousand, two, one thousand, got to 10. And I looked at them like, what's up? And they're like, you didn't move. I was like, oh my God, am I going to be like this for the rest of my life? So when I finally fully awoke, I was afraid to go back to sleep. And that same Dr. N uh, Dr. Nushiguchi came and he sat by my bedside all night. And he's like, I'm not going to leave your side because I know you're afraid. And in the morning, we're going to tell you what you have and what happened. So the next morning, I got because they want you to walk right away. I'm pushing my little uh, thing with the IV and the thing with the with urine and all that stuff. And I go to the phone and I call Joe. And I'm like, they try to kill me. I go to a pay phone. And that time, I was just dating Joe for like what? Joe's sitting over there, so I'm pointing like five or six months at the time and just like what what happened what happened i was worried i didn't hear from you all night i was so worried and so um i called my parents and they came down right away well the doctors had already called them and said come down we have to talk and they started telling my mom what happened and my mom was like i was there i kept calling and i i know that my mom kept calling from downstairs saying what's up with my daughter i haven't heard anything is she okay what's taking this surgery so long my mom stayed there till like five or six in the evening and then she went home with my aunt radiance because my brother was only 10 months old at the time oh it's hot hold on guys my brother I, I turned off the air so you wouldn't hear all that noise but now i'm hot yeah my brother was 10 months old at the time my mom had my mom had to go take care of him because my aunt was taking care of him so I don't hold that against, I didn't hold that against my mom, but I was like, you left me. Oh my God, you left me. And so they told her that I had pseudocolonesterase deficiency and that I had to wear a medical alert bracelet. This is why I wear this bracelet. That's why it kind of hurts my heart that I get a lot of flack at my cooking channel when people say, oh, a fat chef that's wearing a medical alert bracelet. She probably has diabetes. You guys know I, I deal with that, right? But anyways, I think from that day, my life has been anchored back to that time and i didn't realize it until i went back into my old vlogs from babs bear talk and every december 10th i put it's another birthday it's another birthday because i felt like i started to live on that day because i really felt like i could die that day you know and i think that fear has dictated my whole being because even when i was having my babies i was worried about having you know needing a c-section and jada was breached she was feet first one week before she was uh, born and i went to the church and they laid hands and jada turned and i was like oh thank you god never had any drugs with the delivery of my babies when i hear people say oh i'm gonna go with a midwife and do it drug free i'm like is there any other way i don't know any other way right when i had a dnc because i miscarried a baby after um well before right before i got pregnant with jada they did that without any drugs because they didn't know what to give me so this deficiency that I have is very rare. Back in 1984, when they found out that I had it, um, it was only one in every million people that had it. It's autosomal, meaning that both parents had to put together and give me a bad gene. And that's how I came up with it. So if you have something that's autosomal, the math says that 25% of your children are going to come up with it. So my mom and dad had four kids, so I'm the 25%. I'm, I'm the blessed one, right? So... Um, 
when the doctor started to talk about two and a half years ago that if it's your gallbladder we might just have to end up taking it out i'm like mm -mm, girl she crazy i'm gonna do everything to change i changed my eating change my drinking change everything that i needed to change those polyps appeared they disappeared and then finally it came to the point where they said you need to have surgery and i knew that i needed to have surgery because the life that i was living wasn't really an existence but guys, let me tell you, I was petrified. That word came back again, fear. I just had tremendous fear about this. And I think my family had fear too, but they didn't verbalize it. And that's why when I saw that video that Joe made that was up just before this one, it just showed me how fearful he was. But he's the kind of um, husband where he won't tell you because he don't want you to be petrified. Like when I was losing my baby and they were doing those tests every day to see if the hormones was growing, that, that would mean the baby was still there and viable. I went to Joe and I said, it's gonna be okay, right? I never once asked him if I'm gonna miscarry. I just said, it's gonna be okay, right? And he goes, it's gonna be okay. And I believed him and I went through the most horrible uh, time of my life then when I miscarried that baby, but it's, it was okay. I'm here, it was okay, right? I have Jada now and all that stuff. So anyways, let's go back to five days ago when I had the surgery. When I went for the pre-op, I was a little bit nervous, but when that pre-op doctor told me, look, when you see polyps in any one of your organs, 99.9% .9 of the time, they're benign, but there's always that little infinitesimal, is that the right word, uh, chance that it could be malignant. Girl, take that thing out and throw it in the trash. I was done. I'm like, I'm there for it. I'm not going to be nervous. I'm there. Went to bed, slept peacefully, got up that morning, was at peace. Several people called me to pray, different... Uh, uh, different people uh, sent me text and I went in and they told me to get there at 9 and I was like let's go now Joe it's 8 15 I'm ready let's go I wanted them to do the surgery that night when I was already mentally ready got there they, they worked me in quicker than they had anticipated instead of going into the operating room at 10 30 I went in at 10 to 10 uh, when the anesthesiologist came in and remember I had had consults with these PAs the day before and they had you know they had reassured me but the guy walked in Dr. Webb and he's my new hero now, okay? He's my new hero. And he walked in and he says, Hi, Barbara, I'm Dr. Webb, and I'll be your anesthesiologist. Hello, could we please stop making noises over there? That's Joe reading a magazine over there. And he said, I heard that you have a history of pseudocolonus deficiency. And I said, yes. And I said, you're not going to give me sucks, are you? Now, how I know about all these medications is because after I had my miscarriage, I went to the Loma Linda Medical Library and I looked up everything about my deficiency, how it came about, how it's treated. I learned then that more people were showing up with it because we were having kids. So now I'm only one in every quarter of a million. I'm not one in every million anymore. And um, I learned the drug succinylcholine, what that was about. I learned about um, anticholinergics and antispasmodic uh, drugs, and I learned their brand names, their, you know, uh, no-name brand. You know, I learned everything about these drugs, and I committed it to memory, all right? This bracelet tells a medical person everything they need to know about me. They just call this number, these people will answer the phone, and they'll say, this is her doctor, this is her husband, this is what she can't have, yada, yada. But I needed to know that for myself so that I could go in there and speak very educated to the doctors. Let me tell you, a lot of people will tell you that doctors don't want you to speak educated to them because they, they kind of feel a type of way, like you know too much. Not my doctors, because I have a way of speaking to them where they know that I know, but I'm not like pushing it down their throats. So the minute he came in, the, the drug sucks choline the short for it is sucks so when I said you're not gonna give me sucks are you and he says hell no I don't want to be here all day and so I said I love you already because I don't want to be here all day either so then he started to ask me questions and this is when I learned everything that I didn't understand for the past 34 years it's not the anesthesia that I have trouble with guys it's the paralytic all right so they only have a few paralytics that they give you i think it's only like a couple one of them is succinylcholine and this new one that they gave me which is rock uranium now i don't really know how new it is but it's something else that they've been using for people who have issues with sucks so the doctor was like i'm not going to give you sucks at all did you hear me at all and he says because sucks works with your body and it acts like it's a part of your body. So when we give it, we, we like to give that because when you give it to, uh, to you, it's assimilated in quickly. It paralyzes you. We do the job, we get out, and then you're unparalyzed. And so he says, and I don't know if the word is unparalyzed, but that's the word I'm using. So he says, um, when you went through that ordeal 34 years ago, why did they not put you back to sleep? Why did they not put you on anesthesia? And I said, 
well, because the anesthesia had me that way, right? And he goes, no, anesthesia is separate and a paralytic is separate. And so he's, uh, I said, well, I, I, I guess I, I never really did realize that, you know? So he's all like, let me tell you something, Barbara. If you wake up, if I wake you up from this anesthesia and you are still paralyzed, I will tell you, Barbara, you are still paralyzed. The rock, you rock, uranium did the same thing that the, um, sucks is doing and even though i've given you the antidote for the sogamatics or whatever the other drug is called i'm going to put you back to sleep and i'm going to sit here and wait with you and i'll see you in 10 hours i'll tell you and i said okay i i prefer to know and i prefer to not be awake so he says if on the chance that i wake you up and you are not paralyzed anymore but you still can't breathe on your own i will not put you back to sleep at that point you'll be awake your family can come in and talk with you and everything. They will sit with you, but you will not be able to talk with them because you'll be on that machine, but you'll be fully awake. And so he says, how are we going to communicate? And I said, well, will I be able to move my arms? And he goes, likely, but you will not be able to use fine motor skills. And I said, well, I know sign language. And he says, well, let's get some signs out of the way because I know some sign language, but I'm rusty. I say, I rusty too. So he says, okay, let's go over the word for fine. Let's go over the word for not fine, which is you know, not doing well. And so we did that. And he goes, okay, you're ready. So then another anesthesiologist came in. She was a Vietnamese young lady, Song, like S-O-U-N-G-H, something like that. She says, she says, it's like sing a song. She was so pretty. She had a pretty smile. And she says, I'm going to administer your um, anesthesia. And I said, I thought he was going to do it. And she says, don't panic. He's going to be right on my shoulder when I do it. I said, are you going to intubate me, Song? And then she said, yes. I said, could you please not break my teeth because they're my moneymaker, you know, because that's what I do YouTube with my teeth. <laughs> And she laughed and then I grabbed her arm and I said, Song, I just want you to know that I trust you. And she says, oh my God, you don't know what that feels like to gain the trust of the patient. I will do right by you. I'll be right here by your side, okay? Don't fear. So then she did whatever she was doing and she left and she came back and pulled the door open and she said, Barbara, the doctor wants to know if you need an anti-anxiety med. I'm like, I don't think so. I'm not like, my heart's not palpitating or anything. I think I'm okay. And so the doctor popped his head in Dr. Webb and he said, I only ask because has anybody ever discussed the fact with you that you might be suffering PTSD? And I'm like, no, I said PTSD. I don't think I'm suffering PTSD. I said, um, over what? And he says, over what happened to you 34 years ago? And I said, well, I don't have nightmares about it, but it is a very relevant part of my whole being. You know, I talk about it often. I celebrate every December 10th as the day that I was born again, you know, after that surgery and everything I said, but I don't like sit here and sweat bullets. And he goes, well, that's good. And he says, well, I don't think you need the meds, but I just wanted to know if you needed it. And he goes, you should really look into that because I really do feel like you're suffering some PTSD. And he says, maybe it'll be resolved with this surgery because I promise you it's going to go different. And I go, okay. So they put me in the operating room. Everything moved quickly. They covered my face with the mask and that felt good. That was like some oxygen, I guess. And they had the IV. They had to put IV here. See, you guys don't believe me that I just had surgery. People who are watching the story that I look, see. I still have the big old ugly bruise because they put the IV here first, but my veins weren't having it. Same thing that I wrote in here, my veins collapse. Uh, well, they didn't collapse this time, but they're small and they roll. And so they put it in here and they pumped the drug and the drug burned. Oh my God, it burned. And that's because they can't give me lidocaine because I can't have anything from the cane family because that makes me sleep too long. If everything stops my breathing and I sleep too long. And so they had, they really, really had a task on their hands. So uh, they put me under, the next hero was Dr. Johnson that did the surgery because he did not nick my bile duct. He did not nick my artery. He did everything on point and he got into some little bitty, bitty holes and came out, right? And so when I woke up, it seemed like I was asleep for 20 minutes. Sometimes I'll fall asleep on the couch at night when I'm editing and stuff. And then I'll wake up like 20 minutes later. It felt like that type of a sleep, like a power nap. And when I opened my eyes, I could hear the nurse say, you did good, you did good, honey. And so I was like, oh my God, I said, Song, Song. I'm asking for the anesthesiologist, right? And I go, who's Song? And I said, she put me on there. And he goes, oh, she's in another operating room, but you're fine, Dr. Webb will come talk to you and Dr. Johnson will come talk to you. And I go, okay. And I said, what time is it? And they said, just before 11 o'clock. And I said, at night? And she says, no, it's in the daytime. I said, oh my God, I never said that so many thank you gods. Thank you God, thank you God, thank you God, thank you God, thank you God. Thank you. I just heard myself over and over say thank you God. By then, John, the kids weren't there in the room yet. It was just me and the nurse. 
And I looked at the nurse and I said, did I wake up combative? And then she said, no. I said, did I bite anybody? She said, no. And she says, you were so funny because when you woke up, you were doing something weird with your right hand. And I was like, Dr. Webb, you better come back. Your patient's doing something weird with her right hand. And she's still paralyzed. And he came back and he said, oh, she's doing sign language. She's spelling her husband's name, J-O-E. Over and over again, I was spelling Joe, Joe, Joe. And so I was like, oh my God, I still love him. Yes, I miss him. And so then, by then they sent, um, Joe sent Joshua and Jada in because Jory didn't uh, arrive to the surgery until after the surgery was done because Jory is in summer school and it was the first day of the second half of summer school. And if he missed that class, they, they, they would have likely dropped him and I didn't want him to be dropped from the class. And I knew in my heart that I was going to be okay because of all your prayers and stuff. So I'm like... Jory, you can go to school. Don't worry about it. I'll be fine. I'll be fine. When Jory left for school, he hugged me and he goes, Mom, please be fine because I take I can't take care of these people. Because Jory feels like he takes care of the whole household, right? You know, middle child syndrome and all that stuff. Yeah, so um, Josh and Jada came in. They were so happy to see me. And they stayed for a few minutes and then Joe and, uh, Jory was able to come in. And um, then I sent the three kids to go buy me juice and stuff because I wanted juice when I got home. And Joe stayed by my side. And by then, that's when I realized that from my wrist down to my fingertips still felt kind of prickly. Like kind of like if you fall asleep on your hands like this and you wake up and you're trying to come to life. So the nurse said, I'm going to call because I said, should my hands still feel like this? And she says, let me call Dr. Webb to find out. And she said, um, I said, please don't frighten him or anything because I think I'm fine. I think it's coming back to life. I just wanted to ask before you sent me home because the surgery was done by 11. They were trying to send me home by noon. And so then she called Dr. Webb and he was in another operating room and she said, the patient is complaining. That, and I said, no, 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 I didn't complain. I didn't complain. You guys, I didn't want to complain because they treated me so well that I don't want to be a complaining patient. And she goes, no, that's just the way we speak here. And so she told him and he says, keep her another hour. If that doesn't wear off, call me and I'll come back. That wore off within 10 minutes of that phone call because they heated up the blankets. And then my hands came back to life and by then I could get my phone and start texting y'all and all that stuff. And I'm telling you guys, I'm coming back to that word fear, F-E-A-R, how I started this um, story time. That stands for false evidence appearing real. It's not true. It's not true. Guys, I can take surgery. I can take anesthesia. What I can't take is that one paralytic. And the paralytic that the man gave me, he told me he had to give me double the dose for what they needed to do because the cut is so high up. And if my potassium was high and he gave me double the dose, he could stop my heart. So they had already tested my potassium the day before and it was fine. So I was good to go. And he says, I have the antidote. And he showed me that the syringe, he goes, I have the antidote right here. I will wake you up. The, I think that one is like sugar maddox or sugar maddox or something. And he says, I'll wake you up, Barbara. Don't worry. And so now uh, I'm faced with a new set of realities. I guess I've learned how long the camera will record before it stops on its own. Um, I, I don't have to anchor my life back to December the 10th, 1984 anymore. I can live in the present, 2018. 2018 is the year when my life changed because they took out my gallbladder and I know that I'll be made a thousand percent whole and I'll be able to eat some of the things that I used to once enjoy and can't eat anymore. And I don't have to live in that fear about this deficiency that I have and the drugs that I can't and cannot have. I still can't have a whole bunch of drugs now, a bunch of different drugs that you can have regularly. I cannot have, but at least I know that they're, they're finding alternatives, you know, and I don't have to live cursed under this um, deficiency and living in fear for the rest of my life. So I just wanted to share this story with you guys. I hope you guys enjoyed. If you like it, thumbs up, leave me a comment. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. And um, on Thursday, I'm going to put up a, a one week vlog. I've been taking this time to rest and edit my cookbook. And then um, I, I'm, you're going to keep seeing videos at the cooking channel that the kids are creating. Okay. I love you all. Thank you all for your support and your love and your prayers. And thank you all so much for being the wind beneath our wings, all of our wings. All right. I'll see you guys soon. Bye bye. Yeah, daddy, you know, you came on off. Yeah, that's a fact.